very serious problem. Not only does America have a very serious problem, but our people have I think that we need to have a relatively clear view of what the African American community faces and where it wants to go. Now, I think once we have that, then we can invite anybody else to the party, but we need that. We have to, if we are going to follow the description which I've laid down, pan-Africanism or perish. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dennis Boatwright, and I'm the host of the Dennis Boatwright Journal. This program will be aired bi-monthly on Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today, we will talk about the fascinating life of the late Dr. Ronald Walters, a preeminent political scientist whose spirit and scholarship impacted so many lives. Ron Walter is considered the chief architect of black politics because quietly and behind the scenes, he drafted blueprints that many black organizations follow. At an early age, Dr. Walter entered a lifestyle that transformed him to, into the ultimate race man that he became. This role required him to dedicate no less than his entire life to the liberation of people of African descent. But very few people outside political circles know about Dr. Walters. For example, it is less known that in 1958, he became the first leader of a sit-in movement at Dockham Drugstore in Wichita, Kansas. The actions of Dr. Walters and the other students forced Dockham to ultimately desegregate that drugstore. Eventually, Walters' ambitions inspired him to move to the seat of power in Washington, D.C. To summarize his accomplishment, Dr. Walters helped organize the 1972 National Black Political Convention held in Gary, Indiana. And to be honest, many people don't even remember that. The National Black Political Convention of 1972. And just as a, as, as, as a uh, small antidote, you know, me and my wife and kids, we drove from Detroit to Gary, Indiana, and actually took pictures because nobody is talking about it. Because I would thought that some of the people, at least we would have a 50th anniversary of that event, that enormous event that had hold, held so much promise. But, you know, after Dr. Walters continued his career in Washington, D.C., he be started to become somewhat known in a quiet way. Unsurprisingly, by this time, Walters gained international stature. In the early 1990s, he was invited to, a, to be a political observer and consultant to help construct Nelson Mandela's apartheid South African government. Despite his enormous body of work, very few outside political circles know who Dr. Walters is. And as I said, the reasons for this show, my reasons for this show, is that traveling across the United States, over 140,000 miles in my car with my wife and kids after uh, we saw that George Floyd was murdered by police, we drove in our car. Sometimes my wife would be have just rollers and pajamas on. But we rode around to see what Black America was about. So in the process of me going to D.C. five times, me going to Brooklyn, Bronx, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio, you name it. But I rarely came across people who can talk about Dr. Ron Walter as the guest that I'm about to invite here. Many people know one of my other favorite scholars, Dr. John Henry Clark. Many people know him. Many people also know Dr. Claude Anderson, who is a great scholar. But nobody is saying anything about John here about Dr. Ronald Walters. So this kind of really, being honest, kind of upset me. So I said I have to do something about it. So I tried to read all of his books and trying to contact people who know him. My next guest, my guest, Dr. Wilmer Leon, is one of the best. One of the best people who knew Dr. Walters 
intimately and closely as a, as a mentor and as a friend. And I am very gracious to have Dr. Wilmer Leon on this show because of his scholarship and his insight. And plus he's finally, he's a political scientist because as I say, traveling, you know, I'm a Pan-Africanist like uh, Dr. Walter says he is. However, most of my friends are psychologists. They are uh, historians or Egyptologists. I can't find no political science friends. So it, 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 it is a pleasure to finally have a pure political scientist, not a person who talks about politics, but study politics as a, as a discipline. So it is an honor to have Dr. Wilma Leon uh, to this show. Dr. Wilma Leon. Sir. Yes. Dr. Wilma, Le Dr. Wilma J. Leon III is a political scientist and author whose primary areas of expertise are American government, black politics, and public policy. Currently, Dr. Leon is a nationally broadcast radio talk show host, political science professor, nationally syndicated columnist, and regular political commentator on national and international news programs. Dr. Leon earned a BS degree in political science from Hampton Institute, a master's in public administration from Howard University, and a PhD in political science from Howard University. His recent book, Politics, Another Perspective, Commentary and Analysis on Race, War, Ethics, and American Political Landscape is on, in the age of Obama, is available on Amazon.com. Dr. Leon, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm just going to step out your way and let you talk about uh, Dr. Walters. <laughs> wow. Many other things. Many other things. So, Well, uh, Dennis, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, wow. I, it, it's, I don't even really know where to start uh you, your introduction you, you you pretty much captured it uh dr walters uh was without a doubt one of the uh one of the most brilliant minds that i've ever come across but at the same time he was one of the most humble people that you that you'd ever want to meet and uh i'm a i'm a political scientist because of him uh, i went to howard to study under him you you probably would have been better served uh, talking to Dr. Robert Smith or Dr. Clarence Lusain. Uh, both Robert Smith is considered to be, without doubt, uh, Dr. Walter's finest student and one of his closest friends. Uh, as and and Dr. Clarence Lusain, I think, uh, would be right there, right there behind Robert Smith. But so I, I'm I'm humbled uh, to really be here uh, to to talk a little bit about my dear, dear mentor and, and friend, uh, uh, Dr. Ronald Walters. You're muted. Yes, Dr. Wilma Leon. Yes, sir. Before we get into the main subject of Dr. Ron Walters, can you share with us what picked your interest in political science? Well, actually, uh, I, I went to Hampton Institute to uh, as a political science major, and was blessed there to have been uh, uh, to to have studied under the chair of the political science department at that time, uh, Mr. Novell Dickinson, and uh, Mr. Dickinson really uh, expanded my worldview, uh, and uh, I went to Hampton to study political science, not to be a political scientist, but uh, to go to law school. It, and, and, I, and I went to uh, UC Davis Law School. At the, at the time that I was uh, an undergrad, political science was thought by many to be one of the better majors to have if you were interested in going to law school. So it, it wasn't really my interest in political science as it was my interest in pursuing law. And it wasn't until I came across Dr. Walters that I uh, decided that political science was going to be my calling. 
Oh, okay. Also, my next question to you is, you know, I often listen to your show and I really enjoy your show. And at the end of this show, we will try to, um, you can give information on how people can listen to your, your weekly program mm -hmm. on Sirius XM. But I'll let you do that because you know more of it than I do. Can you explain to viewers what you mean by I'm not a political operative, I'm a political scientist? What I mean by that is my job, I believe, and this is something that I learned from Dr. Walters, is to tell you the truth. Uh, I'm not going to give you my opinion. And if I do, I'll tell you this is my opinion. One of the things I remember he said to us in class uh, uh, was uh, one of he had asked a question and or, or one of my colleagues, one of my classmates was 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 reading a paper and uh, made made some some inane point. And Dr. Walter stopped him and, and, and he said, excuse me, but where did you get that from? And uh, my classmates, well, well, Dr. Walters, uh, that's my opinion. And Dr. Walsh just put it, he said, he said, stop. He said, young man, I don't care about your opinion. I want to know what you've read. I'm training scholars here. Keep your opinion to yourself. Tell me what you've read. And so you'll find a lot of political analysts, you'll find a lot of political pundits. Usually when you're watching one of the mainstream shows, they're going to give you point counterpoint. They're going to give you a Republican strategist and a Democratic strategist. I, my job as a political scientist is to tell you the truth as the data demonstrates to me that the truth is. So I think particularly as an African-American who is a political scientist, uh, we can get very, very caught up in picking sides, uh, not criticizing African-American politicians, not criticizing active African-American activists. No, if you're wrong, you're wrong. And one of the things that my father always told me, the one thing about right, it's always right. And the one thing about wrong, it's always wrong. So I'm going to do my best based upon my research and my analysis to tell you the truth. I'm not a political uh uh, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a political uh, scientist. I am not a political operative. Can you? I can't hear you. Thank you, Doctor mm -hmm. uh, Wilma Leon. You know, many people expect for political scientists be to be highly opinionated. But as I said in the beginning of this commentary, that we go, we have to go by what the facts present themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. And people want us to be like color commentators who come out with this hyperbolic language and let's go do this and this. But we have to, you know, as political scientists, we look and see, we have to first figure out is that is that strategy feasible? What is the what is the likely outcome of that? And if not, we probably we will reserve our judgment or reserve promoting any type of actions. And that's what I like about Dr. Ronald Walters. He reminded me of a master chess player who never project this next move. And sometimes as a good player, you cannot get caught up on whether you might, you know, lose a piece here and there, because that's going to happen. You got to look about you got to think about winning the game. And this is how to how you have to look at world affairs. But I wanted to ask you, getting to the, the juice of the this uh, talk, is how did you meet Dr. Ronald Walters? One night I was uh, at home watching Nightline. Uh, Ted Koppel was the host at the time. And he, it, he was doing an analysis uh, post-Jackson, Jesse Jackson presidential campaign. And he was talking to this guy about the, the value of the campaigns. And, and, and Ted's point seemed to be that 
Reverend Jackson's campaigns were not as significant as many people were making them out to be. And the guy he was talking to was cutting Ted to pieces, unmercifully, just slicing Ted to pieces. But Ted didn't even know he was getting cut. The, the brother was so calm. Uh, he was so fact-based. He was using the data. And I was just captivated by this guy's analysis. And then they put up on the screen Dr. Ronald Walters, chairman of the political science department at Howard University. And I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. The next day, I called him and I said, hey, man, quote, hey, man, I saw you last night on Nightline and I want to hang out with you. He said, well, talk to my secretary, make an appointment, come see me. And that was it. Uh, shortly thereafter, I, I got a chance. I went down to the office. I sat there and there and I talked to him and uh, I enrolled in the PhD program. And I was blessed to have uh, some courses with him. He left Howard and went to Maryland shortly after, after I got there. But I, I, I was blessed to have had some classes with him. But more importantly, uh, he became a mentor of mine. And I learned probably more from him uh, talking to him on the phone and sitting in his living room <laughs> that I learned from him in class. But um, that, that's how I met him. Wow, what a fascinating story. You know, unfortunately, I didn't get to meet Dr. Ronald Walters uh, personally, but I bet you as many nights I done fell asleep with this book <laughs> on my pillow. As yeah, well as this that's book. the, yeah, Black Interest, uh, uh, white, uh, white Nationalism, Black Interest. Yeah, that, that's a phenomenal book right there. Well, yeah. all of his books are phenomenal books, but but uh, one of my favorites is White Nationalism, Black Interest. Yeah, I had, you know, one day I was watching Dr. Ronald Walters on CNN News on C-SPAN, and he was giving this analysis on, on actually with C-SPAN 2, mm -hmm. and he was doing a book review, and he did a, a nice analysis of what white nationalism was in terms of its political manifestation. And mm -hmm. at the time, many people uh, didn't know what was to come 10 years later. The Tea Party. And we're going to get to that part in a minute, but it's, okay. it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fascinating. And one thing about Ron Walters, when he was, he was actually given uh, a book review at the Politics and Prose mm -hmm. uh, bookstore in Washington, D.C., and normally, there's a, there's a majority white audience. And Dr. Ron Walters said what he had to say. Mm -hmm. And he, without offending anybody, although he was um, frontally attacking white nationalism and its political manifestations. And a lot of many people are, are not able to do what Dr. Walters was able to do. But I wanted to ask you in particular, in particular, what impact did Dr. Ron Walters have on your understanding of world affairs? Well, that's an interesting question because I can't answer that question without mentioning a few other names. Uh, Dr. Mac Jones, uh, Again, Mr. Novell Dickinson from Hampton, uh, Dr. Joe McCormick, Dr. Laniel Henderson, some of the uh, Dr. Maurice Woodard. These were some of the professors that I had at Howard. And I, I tell people all the time, I, I was very blessed uh, to have been trained by and to still have access to some of the sharpest knives in the drawer. Uh, so uh, Dr. Walters didn't exist in a vacuum. Um, and, and Howard University's political science department, particularly uh, the black politics focus, particularly at the time I was there, was, was, was just phenomenal. Um, one of the things that 
that he that Dr. Walters introduced me to was a piece written by Dr. Mac Jones, uh, a message to the black political scientist, where where uh, where Mac uh, writes about the responsibility as an African American political scientist to broaden our Weltanschauung, to broaden our worldview, that we have to do our research and our reading uh, and focus on our literature. That if you merely focus on the literature and the analysis from the dominant culture, you won't be able to develop the worldview from the perspective of an African-American political scientist. So it was that understanding being grounded in our literature so that you have a better understanding of our reality that enables us to provide the analysis that needs to be provided so that we can shape policy, so that we can shape uh, outcomes uh, as they are relevant to us as whether you consider yourself to be an African in America or an African American. Also, yeah, you know, Dr. Wilmer, Leon, please feel free to expand upon any necessary information we believe to have, because after all, we want to get Dr. Ron Rothers out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, this is hopefully this is one of my missions in life to keep Dr. Ronald Walters alive, because that's what we're missing today. Mm -hmm. we, we, we got too many uh, historians you know, Pan-African historians, Egyptologists, I'm not saying too many. We have to balance it out with political scientists at some of our conferences. Otherwise, we're not going to get a full picture. I agree with you a thousand percent. We're, we're not going to get a full picture. And that's one thing to, you know, give a great speech or something like that. But what is your blueprint to achieve those objectives? And we don't see that because there we don't see too many Ron Walters out here. Mm -hmm. So this is the, one of the reasons why I uh, thought it necessary to talk about Dr. Walters. But my next question is, how, in your opinion, how instrumental was Dr. Ron Walters in shaping Black politics during the Black Power movement and the post-civil rights era? Well, he was he was incredibly, incredibly powerful and incredibly important. You mentioned the 1958 Dockham uh, uh, lunch counter integration in in Wichita, his home, his home uh, hometown, uh, two years before the students at Greensboro staged their sit in. He was known as the grandfather of the of the sit in movement. Um so from a from a very young man, uh, he was focused on uh, human rights. He was focused on civil rights. He was focused on the on the black liberation struggle. Uh, you mentioned also that he was one of the conveners of the 1972 uh, Gary political black political convention, uh, which was incredibly, incredibly powerful and incredibly, uh, incredibly important. He. Uh, was also uh, he 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 got a lot of his uh, political policy experience working for both Congressman Charles Diggs as well as uh, Bill Gray, and of course we know that he was one of the architects uh, and uh, of the of Reverend Jackson's eighty four and eighty eight uh, presidential campaigns, and and what a lot of people don't really understand is that. Uh, Reverend Jackson went to the 88 convention with over 1,200 delegates, a very, very powerful position. And one of the things that came out of that, that really uh, enabled uh, uh, then Senator Obama to garner the Democratic nomination was as the Democrats were negotiating with Reverend Jackson in 88 uh, to leave the campaign, to join the ranks and to back the Democratic nominee, one of the concessions that the party had to make to Reverend Jackson was no longer winner take all, but proportional distribution of delegates. 
and it and it was the proportional distribution of delegates that enabled Senator Barack Obama to stay in the race long enough for him to get traction so that he could then eventually go on and become the Democratic uh, nominee for president, the Democrat nominee for president. So uh, those are just some of the highlights, not even touching on uh, his anti-apartheid stance, his pro-Palestinian stance, uh, the work he did both for Palestinian liberation, which we are all still fighting for, and of course his work uh, with uh, in South Africa in the anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, he was he was always working, always working, always writing, always thinking, and uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal mind. And you can never talk about Dr. Ronald Walters without talking about his wife, Patricia Walters, because she was really uh, that that constant uh, in in his life, in his work uh, that enabled him to she edited a lot of his, if not all of his work. And she, in, in her own right, phenomenal mind, phenomenal human being, and we're still very blessed to have her with us. Dr. Uh, Leon, you mentioned, Dr., um, you mentioned the Reverend Jesse Jackson and his run, his uh, presidential runs. Mm -hmm. So I, it brings me to ask, how did Dr. Walters become involved and Reverend Jesse Jackson's uh, campaign run, uh, presidential runs. I don't know the. I I tried to to uh, talk to Reverend Jackson today. I wasn't able to get him because I don't know. I, I was trying to get the actual story of how did they meet, and how did Doctor Walters become so significant in the campaign. I wasn't able to get uh, Reverend Jackson, so I don't know the, uh, the, the specifics, but I can give you a, a broader answer, which is understanding the direction of Reverend Jackson's campaign, which was really a rejection of mainstream liberalism and mainstream Democrat, Democratic Party politics in favor of a uh, or more radical redistributive economics and policy agenda, if that's the direction you're going to go as a candidate, then at that time, Ronald Walters was the only guy you could go to uh, to help you develop those strategies and to help you develop the policies that were going to get you there. And so based upon his work in the 72 Gary uh, Convention, which Reverend Jackson was a part of, understanding uh, uh, Dr. Walter's relationship with so many of the other uh, very powerful individuals in Black politics at that time, again, if you were going to go away from the mainstream program and you were going to develop a real grassroots, effective, redistributive, uh, reparative justice type of program, then Dr. Walters was 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 your default uh, was your default guy. Okay, wow, wow. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, but it's unfortunately that there's not too many Dr. Ron Walters left, especially in this political climate. And, and let me and, and let me let me give you another example of that. Uh, that would be Barack Obama. I was I was talking with um, Governor Wilder a while ago, and we were uh, he, Governor Wilder was giving me some of his analysis of uh, the Obama uh, 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 administration and 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 what he saw were some of the flaws. And I said, I said to the governor, I said, you know, one of the one of the big mistakes I think uh, President Obama made was he didn't he didn't have the right people around him. And Governor Wilder looked at me and said, well, who who do you think those people should have been? I said, well, I'll put it this way. If I had been elected president, 
the first people I would have had with me in the Oval Office. There would have been three people, Willie Brown from California, Dr. Walters, and Governor Wilder. Those would have been the three, first three folks that I would have had in the room saying, okay, fellas, how are we going to get this done? And none of them, <laughs> well, Willie Brown was, was, was probably a fairly close, but uh, Dr. Walters and, and, and Governor Wilder were not. And under, and I understand because one of the things that they wanted to be sure that Barack Obama never was perceived as was being too black. So, uh, but if you're talking about political minds, if you're talking about policy, if you're talking about strategy, Willie Brown, Doug Wilder, and Ron Walters, those were your guys. Wow, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing, Dr. Uh, Leon, what you bring up. And the fact that sometimes it may just be disheartening that no one from the Obama administration or campaign contacted, even, you know, Dr. Ronald Walters, even using back channel. Well, now, let me, let me, let me, let me be very clear in, 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 in that I'm not saying he wasn't contacted because he was, but from my understanding, that was more of a periphery kind of engagement. He was not brought in as part of the kitchen cabinet, so to speak, as he as he should have been um, if President Obama and those in his administration really wanted to be more effective as it related to policy that was going to impact and improve the lives of African Americans, as well as uh, people of color all around the world, the, the whole di diaspora. Well, thanks for the clarification, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Walters, because that's a big point. You know, many people often ask me, and I'm unable to answer the question, and you were positioned better to give a, uh, a clear reason why Dr. Ron Walters' name may not have been what they say called ringing bells during uh, the 2008 uh, presidential cycle. But I want to fast forward a little bit to mm -hmm. South Africa. Now, how did how did Ron Walters become involved in post-apartheid South African politics? Well, he was a major international speaker uh, for, for reparations, for peace, as well as social justice. Uh, he was, I think, uh, a major player in, the, uh, in a lot of the African Liberation Support Committees. Uh, and and uh, he was a participant at the uh, World Conference Against Racism uh, in Durban. Uh, he wrote a lot about apartheid, uh, abolishing apartheid. Uh, he was one of those that was instrumental in developing uh, grassroots relationships and, and organizations between uh, uh, entities here and 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 entities uh, in South Africa, as a uh, policy person with Charles Diggs, uh, that that helped him uh, uh, become known as as Diggs and others were working for the abolish apartheid movement. Uh, he was a senior advisor to Congressman Diggs, I believe. Uh, so, you know, he was always one of those guys in the background that was um, that was always a steady voice, always an, in, an incredibly clear and steady mind on, uh, on policy, on, on strategy, on vision. And uh, he was always also so focused on getting to the core of the issue. He didn't he didn't waste a lot of time. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about a lot of superflu superfluous things. Let's get to the point. Let us understand what the problem is so that we then can develop a strategy and a protocol so that we can get the problem solved. 
And he was always very, very clear. And one of the things that stood out to me, and, and he said this to me in class one day, I asked him, uh, uh, in fact, I had just been uh, granted my, uh, given my first show on WOL uh, on Radio One. Uh, Kathy Hughes had given me my first show and I was talking to him and I asked him, I said, Dr. Walters, how come uh, you don't have your own show? And he, and he looked at me and he started laughing and he said, Wilmer, it's very simple. I've been offered more shows than I can count. But every time we get to sign on the dot, we get to the point of signing on the dotted line and the producers and the backers of the show realize that I'm not going to compromise my principles for their ratings. The shows have gone away. And then he looked at me and he said, as a student of mine, don't you ever compromise. And that has been the, 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 the approach, the methodology, the, 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 the guiding mindset that um, that has carried me up, up to this point. That's why you, you no longer see me on CNN. That's why you no longer see me on MSNBC is because when it got to the point of me having to make some decisions and they realized this brother ain't, comp ain't changing his tune, he's not going to go along with the dominant narrative, shows went away. Not only shows, but jobs as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, for sure. For sure. You know, that's pretty fascinating because very few people will turn down some money and mm. not only yeah. that, as well as fame. Well, let and, me tell you uh, just really quickly. I was offered uh, I won't name the institution, but I was I was uh, fairly recently offered a, a position to be the chair of a political science department at a very well-known uh, institution. And they, in fact, they offered me the job. I accepted the job. I was getting ready to start the job. And when they came back and they said, we've got some issues with your position on Ukraine and what's going on in Ukraine, and we need you to explain your position. And uh, I didn't compromise. I told them the truth. And uh, the position went away. So, you know, uh, but if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And, you know, I've, I've got some folks be, beyond my, 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 my phenomenal parents. I've got some folks like Dr. Walters and Tom Porter and uh, Tony Montero. I, I've got some folks that uh, I got to stay right by. I, I can't afford to have these folks call me and say, hey, man, you're making some good money, but what the hell happened to you? Uh, I, I got to stay true to those that taught me. Dr. Gerald Horn, I, I got to stay true to those that taught me. You know what? And because of your integrity, Dr. Leon is the reason why, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm thrilled to be able to hear to talk to you and see that there are some black intellectuals, black educators who, who, who don't follow, who don't jump on bandwagons, who not chasing the biggest bag of money who stand on principles. And this is one of the reasons why. You're only a few people that I listen to. Actually, the only person I listen to on, on satellite radio. Well, you, and you've, I you're very that. kind. Um, and and let, me, let, me, let me mention an, another name and, and, and a, a dear, dear friend and mentor, and that is Dr. Cornell West. He, he, he's another one that uh, I, I, can't, I can't afford to have him call me. And, and I grew up uh, uh, down the street from him. We're both from Sacramento, California, uh, the, the same, just different parts of the same street, literally, uh, Southland Park Drive. Um, you know, I can't afford to have him call me and say, hey, man, this isn't the way our folks raised us. So, you know, they're, 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 I, I've been very blessed uh, to have been surrounded. And, and those are just some of those that have taught me. I'm not I haven't even started mentioning my classmates. Um but, you know, I've been very, very blessed to have been surrounded and continue to be surrounded by some phenomenal, phenomenal minds. And following uh, Dr. Walter's uh, uh, admonition, uh, don't compromise. Then, you know, we are we are where we are. 
Wow, that, that that's pretty uh, that's that's pretty amazing, you know, Dr. Leon. When you bring out the fact that you know not to compromise, mm-hmm. and when you really look at it, we really need truth tellers out here. We need more Cornell West. We need more Dr. Leons because what's happening is there's somewhat of a vacuum out here because mm-hmm. on the one hand we have our athletes and entertainers trying to be political and now analysts and they're not, and we can't put that burden on them because they didn't go to school, you know, to Howard university or Harvard or what have you to be political scientists. But we see that some of these people who are picking what they call straw man arguments, they're putting these basketball players out and these rappers out and trying to ask them to comment on the complexities of the, the, uh, the um, Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict that's, that's going on. So it's kind of like unfair. So, and they're trying to do their best. Well, and, and Kyrie is a, is a perfect example of that because, uh, you know, God bless him for what he tried to do, but he just wasn't prepared. He's not prepared to do it. When, uh, when, the, uh, when the reporter asked him, are you anti-Semitic? The, the, the response back should have been, well, tell me what I've said that's anti-Semitic. Now, what he did say was, how can I be anti-Semitic if I know who I am? And that statement went right over the heads of everybody in the room. How can I be anti-Semitic if I know who I am? Well, the first thing he should have done was ask the reporter, what does that mean to be anti-Semitic? Because what a lot of people don't realize is Semite is not a group of people. Semite, if you look up the definition, is a language group. I'll say that again. Semite, look it up, is a language group. Hebrew is one of the Semitic languages. Arabic is another Semitic language. So as an African, how can you be anti-Semitic when Arabic and languages spoken by Africans are Semitic languages? See, Kyrie never said that. If Kyrie had said that, he'd have backed them boys right on up. That would have been the the straight right hand. That would have been... That would have been uh, Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson, Buster Douglas straight right hand to the cranium. But Kyrie isn't prepared to engage in the battle at that level. Wow, I mean, you you made that pretty clear, you know. And uh, I try, man. <laughs> well, no, you 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 made it pretty clear. You made it. You made it pretty clear. You and I challenge, clear. I challenge anybody to look at the facts and then don't give me opinion and don't tell me the dominant narrative oh the JDL says and the ADL says look that's their narrative god bless them so based a, upon, go ahead oh no finish your uh, no, I said, I'm, I'm gonna tell you the truth that's all yeah I'm I was gonna, gonna say truth. since we're on this subject what do you believe what this was all about what is this all about? Why did they make a big? What is this all about? Oh, this the, is the this is picture. this is this is about the Zionist government in Israel being incredibly concerned that that public sentiment is shifting, and it's not shifting in their favor. They're losing ground. The BDS movement, the boycott, uh, uh, divest, and, and sanctions movement. Is, great, is gaining traction, which is why that Zionist government in the colony we know as Israel is uh, becoming more repressive. They're assassinating more Palestinians at a faster rate than they have in years because they're losing the argument. And a perfect example of that, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, is look at the World Cup. And you can go to the Times of Israel and find articles that are uh, highlighting the fact that the athletes at the World Cup are not speaking to Israeli journalists. 
they're not wow. in, they're they're not granting interviews to Israeli journalists. As soon as a journalist says they're Israeli, the athlete walks away. Or the athlete says there's no such there, there have been a number of athletes that have said there are there's no such place as Israel. There's only Palestine. I mean, wow. the that's not being reported in West in the Western press. And again, don't hate the messenger, do the research. And 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 you'll find out that and, and that's an example of how, and it's not being again reported in in the Western press, but on the global scale, they're losing the argument. And so they are attacking everybody that they can that they perceive to be in a position to further the alternative narrative. That's why Kyrie got attacked. That's uh, the bigger thanks. that's the bigger picture. Right. Thank you. You know, thank you for bringing that point up because this is never addressed. It's never no. addressed what's so offensive about uh the uh documentary. What's so right. offensive about they want to address that. Now because let me say have I haven't seen it. I I I and I, again, full disclosure, I have not seen it. I have not read the book. I've talked to some very well-informed folks whose opinions I trust, and now we're going to opinion, whose opinions I trust that have seen it, and they tell me there's nothing anti-Semitic about it. The, the, the underlying question that is being asked in the documentary is, if Judaism is came out of Africa, if Africans are the original Jews, then how can the Europeans lay claim to it and how can the Europeans discriminate against African Jews? As I understand it, that's the premise or that's at least one of the major questions that's being asked in the documentary. And it is a question. So if it is a question, then why can't it be discussed? What's the, what's the problem with having the conversation? So, you know, that's, as I understand it, that's what this thing is about. Well, that's exactly, I'm glad you explained that to viewers. I'm going to ask you a question. You know, I was reading this book. This is a nice book by Robert uh, Smith, mm -hmm. Dr. Ron Ronald Walter, how you say his favorite student. And uh, he brought out something. He said that Dr. Walters pretty much predicted the rise of a Donald Trump. Yes. In this book right here. In this yes. Book right here. Yes. Can you please comment on that? Well, what Dr. Walt, by, by, by looking at the political landscape of the time and based upon the experience, the life experience that Dr. Walters had and looking at the data, voting patterns and, and, and issues, what he predicted was the rise of the Tea Party. And we know that Donald Trump was an outgrowth of the Tea Party. And and I, I want to say that was like eight to 10 years. He saw the direction, you know, based upon the Reagan administration and, and the level of conservatism and the white nationalist bent or the white nationalist um, basis upon which a lot of this policy was based. He predicted the rise of the Tea Party, a la the rise of Donald Trump. Uh, Robert is absolutely right. Wow, you know, that's 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 pretty amazing, and I actually recommend people get this book. Because Great book, great. very easy to read. Uh, you, you don't have to be a political scientist to enjoy it. That's one of the things. That was one of the things that originally attracted me to Dr. Walters was how simple he was able to make his explanations. I used to tell people all the time he could take a very complex issue and explain it to a 10-year-old. 
I mean, he was that clear. Um, he was that succinct. His language was very, very simple. Um, so he never, for as brilliant of a man as he was, he, he never came across as an academician. He came across as a really smart dude. <laughs> you know, if, if oh, you understand yeah. what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I, you know, this brings me to the question of, you know, considering the enormous impact and the role Dr. Walter played in black politics, as well as the overall politics, mm -hmm. world politics and American government. Why isn't Dr. Ron Walter as popular as our beloved brother, Dr. Cornell West and, you know, Dr. Uh, John Henry Clark? Why nobody know him? I bring this out. The only person, there's a few people. When I was, I had picked up Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Leonard's going to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I I picked him up from the uh, the airport one day, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I asked him about Dr. I had my fingers crossed. I said, "Can you tell me about you know Dr. Ron Walters?" He said, "Yes, I can," <laughs> and I was elated. But outside of that, I mean, I ran to people who know Dr. Walters and you know hold him in high regard. But you would think a person of this magnitude and importance to our movement, his name will be known like a Theodore Herzl to Zionists or something, or George Keenan to you know to the American government. Why we don't know Dr. Walters? We know who Dr. Claude Anderson is. Well, I think a couple of reasons. One was his personality. He was he was a guy who never sought the limelight. He he was a very humble guy. He was a very simple guy uh, who who wasn't seeking the limelight. And I'm not saying that anybody that you've mentioned is seeking the limelight. I'm saying he just did not do that. Um, I think it's also one of the so his personality was such that. That, that wasn't his thing. And as a younger man, he was a drummer. So if you, if you think about it in the context of a jazz trio or jazz quartet, he was the drummer just keeping the rhythm and moving the music forward with, a, with, a, you know, with an accent. He, he wasn't out front. He was in the back playing the drums, keeping the rhythm, keeping the time, moving the music forward, moving the politics forward as a, as a drummer would be. Um, and he was an academician. He was, he was a, I'll say he was a practicing academician. And what I mean by that is that he was in the classroom, but then he was also in the background behind the scenes dealing with policy. And one of the things I'll say as a political scientist is that those of us that are involved in policy, in many instances, we aren't in the forefront. We're in the background <laughs> De dealing with how the sausage is getting made. We're not, we're, we're, we're the ones helping to make the sausage. We're not the chefs preparing the meal. And the chefs that prepare the meal are the ones that tend to get more of the attention. But you know, you talk to you, you know, you talk to uh I, I, I'll tell you a real quick story. It was the second you know what? let me uh, interrupt you for a minute. Okay, uh, this you you you're bringing a bunch of juicy things that I we ain't mentioned nothing about his you know how did he call him his evil twin, Dr. Ron Daniels. You know, we haven't mentioned him yet, but I will let you continue to what you you just uh mentioned. So uh, we were at the second Million Man March and uh, I was doing the show from there. So I was going through the press entrance and Amiri Baraka was standing there. And so Baraka and I are talking and we're, we're kicking it. And uh, uh, Professor Charles Ogletree walks up. And so the three of us, are talking and kicking it. And then Dr. Clarence Lusain walks up. And Clarence was coming out of the Howard PhD program as I was coming into the program. So the four of us 
are standing there. And then Dr. Walters walks up. And I and so Clarence saw him first, and Clarence goes over to him and hugs him. And then I go over and hug him. And Baraka says, Ron, you know Clarence and you know Wilmer. And Dr. Walters puts his arms around us and he says, Of course, <laughs> these are my boys. <laughs> and Baraka said, Damn, Ron, why is it every bad I meet is one of your boys? And we, <laughs> that was that was oh, yeah. that was a beautiful moment for me. Um, I, oh no, continue with your. No, that was say. it. That, that, no, that was it. That that was it. That, that but he was. He, I love that man. You know, um, he changed my life. Oh, that, he, that, he, he, that man changed my life. And um, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying in, in, in just the, the little bit of space that I can, I'm trying to do right by him. You know, and, you know, probably Dr. Ron Walters, I hope he's, he's looking down and thrilled that you are, you know, uh, you know, continue his legacy, continue the the integrity of the black intellectual. I think you're doing a, a fascinating job. And Very I wanted good. to ask you, and then we're going to eventually, if I don't forget, come back to Dr. Ron Daniels, because he is one of the, I used to see Ron Daniels and uh, Dr. Ron Walters on Tony Brown's journal together. And I, you know, endearingly, you know, they will refer to each other, each other like, this is my evil twin. And uh, so we're going to get to Ron Daniels as well in terms of uh, his association uh, with uh, Dr. Walter, as well as his impact on uh, Black politics, because I know, you know, Dr. Ron Daniels, he's a big champion of Haiti, and he is blowing the trumpet now that He's saying that Haiti is under another imminent invasion. It is. The United States. It is. And he's been doing that. You know, he's been championing uh, Haiti's cause for almost a quarter of a century, if not longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to take my hat off to him. But I want to ask you, Dr. Wilmer, to expound on this very profound uh, statement that Dr. Ron Walter said. And it is, and I'm going to read it. He says, quote, I think we need to have a relatively clear view of what the African-American community faces and where it wants to go. Now, I think once we have that, then we can invite anybody else to the party. But we need that. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think, in fact, let me let me quickly pull that up. I, I think that there are, there are a number of, of elements uh, to that. Uh, one of the things that he was very, very uh, focused on was clarity. Clarity. We need to understand what it is we face. Now, that means what understanding our existence and understanding what are the challenges to our existence and progress, such as white nationalism? And you have to be very, very clear in your analysis of it. You have to be very, very clear in your description of it. And you have to be very, very clear and fact-based on calling it out for what it is. And so once you understand uh, what it is that you're facing, then you can determine where it is you're trying to go. The adage is, of course, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So you've got to understand the challenges that are before you, the historic basis upon which those challenges have been developed. And then as a community, you've got to be very, very clear about where it is 
you're trying to go. What are you trying to accomplish? Then you can develop the strategies and you can champion the policies that are going to facilitate the process. And this is part of something that I think gets overlooked. He says, once we as a community understand that, then we can bring in other people. That piece of it gets overlooked. We cannot have the members of the dominant culture engaging in the analytical process and engaging in the uh, strategic process, we have to do that for ourselves. Once we have done that, then and only then can you bring in others. He says, now, I think once we have that, then we can invite anybody else to the party. But we need that. And it's the then we can invite anybody else that gets overlooked, which is why the CBC is as ineffective as it is. In fact, I just published a piece. Uh, you can find it at Black Agenda Report, and you'll be able soon, I think, to find it at Consortium News called Is the Conscience of the Congress Unconscious? Wow, that, 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 that that's pretty amazing. But, you know, you say you hit on so many points that there's no reason for me to elaborate on it because you, you clarify. See, that's but, a deep statement that he made, but a lot of folks will gloss over that. That's it, it, very, you know, it, 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 Dr. Leon, it, 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 it is very deep because I often tell people because it seems like, you know, because of our history and what we've been through as a people, we are somewhat over anxious and eager to make allies. And when, sometimes when we do that, we find ourselves being a junior partner and we find ourselves uh, really satellites of other groups and they eventually abandon us because, you know, Dr. Walters in this book, he brought out a good point. He brought up, he explains the difference between alliances and coalitions. And he said that people of African descent, black people believe that uh, coalitions are long term. So we become disheartened when our so called friends in the 1960s don't abandon want to be our us. friends no more. They abandon us and we wonder why. And some of these same people today are the exact same people who needed us in the 60s. Now to they further, are to on. further their causes. Their causes. And we, we were cannon fodder for them. And they did the Black Lives Matter like that, and that's there's that's another you know story in right. itself. But right. you know you 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 brought up a, 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 a fascinating point. So you know we we have to realize that, and that's why if you see in my intro, I put that statement on mm -hmm. there because mm -hmm. it was it's, it's very profound. It's very profound. And 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 the other thing with that is, you can't coalesce out of weakness you can only coalesce out of strength. When you try to coalesce out of weakness, that's called capitulation. And, and there are too many of us, and again, this goes right back to the CBC. There are too many of us that are so concerned about being liked, we don't give a damn about being respected, and we surely don't want to be feared. And that's why we are always told, we are always campaigned to, Right. Joe Biden comes into the community and champions all of these initiatives. Eighty five billion dollars for HBCUs. I'm going to do it. I'm, I want to be the most pro labor president in the history of the country. Joe Biden said that. I didn't make that up. But now that the rail workers want one week. One week. Of paid health leave. It's not that they have five weeks and they want six. It's not that they have four weeks and they want five. They have zero and they want one. Now, all of a sudden, Joe Biden can't back the labor movement. Joe Biden's got to back business. Why? Because that's Joe Biden being Joe Biden. 
My point is, the Democrats know what to say to us. They know the right buttons to push. The question is, where's the policy? Where's the policy? And when you start asking that question, shh, oh, oh, don't, don't ask that now. Oh, no, 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 don't ask that now. You're gonna make, you're gonna make them nervous. Oh no, now's not the time for you to ask that question. You're gonna make them nervous. Well, hey, look, you can, you can, you can give the LGB, LGBTQ community uh, uh, the marriage initiative, right? You can give women the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. You can give Latinos um, the DACA, right? Barack Obama did all of that in response to their support for his campaign. Well, what about us? Where's ours? Oh, oh no, we don't want to be too black. We don't want to look too black. We don't want to be too black. Maybe we need to start being blacker and maybe we need to start looking out for us. I, I, I totally agree with that. And, you know, I have to ask you this question. What did the black community lose when Dr. Ron Walters passed away? What did we lose? Brilliance. Clarity. someone that understood the value of a clear political agenda and how to develop and maintain one. We lost, to a great degree, we lost the rudder to the ship. Wow, wow. Wow, that is, that is pretty, you know, fascinating. And also it's somber, you know, to hear that you know, that what we lost. And I'm hoping that there are some, well, you're doing a fascinating job yourself. You know, we, I'm glad to have you here. Well, you're, you know. you're very kind. I, I'm I'm not him in no way. That's why I I remember he, he said to me after I got my degree, he said, uh, he, he put his arm around me and he said, we're colleagues. We, we were sitting in his living room. And he said, he said, uh, we were standing in his living room and he said, we're colleagues. Call me Ron. I said, no, sir. Never. No. Wow. 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 That just reflects the, you know, the respect that you have for him. You have much respect and that's really. No, hard. no. Uh, it's, it's reverence. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a better word. That That's a, that's a better word. That's a very, that's uh, that's a relevant way of uh, really a, a more clear way of putting it, you know, about, and that's how we should be. That's how we should be. We should respect our scholars because, you know, I studied the life of J.A. Rogers. Mm -hmm. I studied the lives of Carter G. Woodson's, Dr. Mm -hmm. John Henry Clark, Francis Cress Welsing, and they went through hell in mm -hmm. the universities. Right. Right. And they have to take pay cuts and many mm -hmm. different things of that nature. Right. So I can imagine what you probably have went through because of your views. And you pretty, you know, I can see why MS um, certain uh, MSNBC and the rest mm -hmm. of them don't want you around mm -hmm. because of uh, what you're going to say. You're a person of, of integrity. And we know that many people, many scholars, were William Leo Hansberry, for example, were chased away from certain universities because mm -hmm. of their integrity. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're missing. We're missing people like Dr. Leon. And I say this because there's a lot, I travel a lot. I can't sit still. I, I, I just travel, I just jump up sometimes spontaneously. And I drive to Atlanta to go see Dr. John Henry Clark's, you know, grave or go, mm -hmm. you know, Go visit uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries in New Jersey, you know, spontaneously. But it's rare that we, there's so many of our younger people 
who need our scholars that they feel that they can touch, that they can understand what they're saying in their books and, and their uh, speeches. And that's one of the reasons that attracted me to Ron Walters, just like Malcolm mm -hmm. X. He talked in plain English mm -hmm. because he was just being himself. He wasn't there to try to impress people. Like we have some of these academics, I'm not going to say their name, but they really sound like Webster's dictionaries more than saying anything. But I wanted to ask you this, this is something that's relevant and you probably the best person to answer this is that uh, what should we, what should our position be at this moment in regards to um, Congressman um, Hakeem Jeffries becoming eventually about to become the minority uh, um, minority leader in the house. How should we view that and what should we uh, expect? Because I'm hearing so many things from people who don't have a political understanding. So Dr. Leon, how should we view that? More of the same. He's not gonna give anything different. Um, what has he done so far? other than uh, spearhead Team Blue, which is a political action committee, a democratic uh, political action committee that sole purpose is to protect the seats of incumbent Democrats from, from being displaced by progressive Democrats. Wow. You know, I asked you that. You, you you know that that's exactly right. You know his 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 record his, his his record in Congress speaks for itself. That's a fascinating point because I have people who often ask me, and the only thing that I probably can say is, you know, because I'm all somewhat of an optimist, even though, you know, I'm hard, you know, and I speak the truth. But sometimes I'm an optimist until I see, you know. So well, I let used, me let me ask you this. Who's, but I agree with who's, you 100%. Who's, whose position is he su succeeding? Whose position is he taking over? Nancy Pelosi. Well, what has Nancy Pelosi done for us? Zilch. Not so then what so why why would after 20 years why would Nancy Pelosi turn over her position to somebody that's going to do something different in that position? You, you 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 bring up you bring up a great point and now it leads me to another current event now how important or is it important at all what's going on the senate race the runoff race in georgia it's very important but i don't know that senator warnock's success or failure is going to result in any dramatic impact on our success or failure as a community. But it's very important because the, the machinations that the Republicans are going through to win this seat, those are, it's anti-democratic. It, vi it, it, uh, it violates the spirit of the Constitution. It's anti-democratic. It, it is, it is anti-voter integrity. They are employing and have been employing in Atlanta uh, voter suppression tactics. And because they're cheating, they should not be allowed to win. They can't prevail. Because if they do, that'll only be impetus and more momentum for them to uh, uh, further attack and roll back the, uh, uh, the, civil, the Civil Rights Act. The vote, I'm sorry, the Voting Rights Act. So on a matter of principle. Plus, Herschel Walker, in the context of being an American senator, has absolutely no business sitting in a seat as a senator. Dude is just not capable. Just as I could never be a running back for the University of Georgia. 
just as I could never play running back in the USS, USFL, he has no business being in the Senate. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He doesn't know what he's talking about. That it's it's a it's a it's they're making a mockery. And he's not the only one, but they're I mean, what's her name? Taylor Green, and you know they got a whole bunch of clowns. So I guess in 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 one in one, if if Marjorie Taylor Green can do it. Then, then why not Herschel Walker? Okay, I understand. I understand that. But is that is that really the level that our politics has devolved to? That, you know, any clown in the circus. I, that ain't me. Wow, you you know you brought up you know every year, uh, Time Magazine, it uh, publishes their person of the year. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this in the context of everything, in your own personal opinion, who is your in who is your personal person of the year of 2022? Ooh. Man, I I don't know. I got I, I got a Dusty Baker. Wow. A great guy, gotcha. by the way. Gotcha. Didn't I get you on that one? Yeah, yeah, you got you got Dusty me on, Baker. You, yeah, you got me on that one. Dirt. He's first a, of all, first gentleman. of all, Dusty Baker is from Sacramento, California. I'm from Sacramento, California. Cornell West is from Sacramento, California. <laughs> so Dusty's homeboy, uh, Dusty Baker. Wow, that, that, what what a great pick! And by the way, I lived in the Bay Area, San Francisco, and Oakland. Okay. And last year, I was just in Richmond. Which is just somewhat south of Sacramento. We're in Oakland. We're in because I I have I have I grew up in Oakland. Okay, I, I'm a, I'm gonna tell you, I used to live in East Oakland. You know, on MacArthur Boulevard, oh, Castlemont yeah. High School, yeah. uh, Sobrani Park. Man, you know. I grew up in Sobrani Park. Oh, okay. You you that's a cross. No, well, you know cross. that's a cutthroat part. Uh, 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 hey, man. Too short to rapper them from. Hey man, no, I uh, my godparents lived uh, in Sobrani Park. I had three aunts and uncles that lived in Sobrani Park. Between you know where you know where um, Arroyo Park is off of Kraus. I I I was between Arroyo Park and Sobrani Park because I had aunts and uncles on Kraus, and I had aunts and uncles that lived in Sobrani Park. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty fascinating. You know, I had just went back there. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And to and to your point, that's a tough part of town. <laughs> it, it's a real, it's a real tough part of town. That's a tough a real, part of town. Yeah, East yeah. East Oakland. Yeah, that that's a real uh, tough tough thing. part of tough part of town. very tough part. You mm -hmm. know, before we go, uh, Doctor Leon, yeah. I want you to tell us about your show how we can viewers can access your show as well as after that can you talk a little bit about your book the show uh inside the issues on Sirius XM 126 Urban View Saturdays from 11 to 2 p.m. Eastern and uh i basically it's basically this show on radio i mean we cover the very same things uh, let me see if I have here. So um, uh, this, for example, this coming this Saturday. Oh, there we go. This Saturday, I have uh, Obi Egbuna Jr. joining me. We're going to talk about the re-release of his father's book, uh, Destroy This Temple, The Voice of Black Power in Britain, written by his dad, Obi Egbuna Sr. That's wow. Good. Wow. Uh, they've wow. just, they've just re, there we go. They've just re-released the book and, uh, Obi Jr. writes the introduction. Oh, okay. Dr. Walters wrote the introduction to my book, but anyway, um, so Obi's going to be on to discuss, uh, the re-release of his father's book is really about the rise of the Black Panther Party in Britain. And, uh, we're also going to be talking about What's the 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 late the peace accords in uh in uh, Ethiopia and a number of other things? What's going on in Mali? A number of things that are happening in countries on the continent 
Then from 12 to 1230, I've got uh, Dr. Uh, James Cavanaugh coming on to talk about the Julian Assange uh, case and the fact that now the New York Times as well, the New York Times just wrote an open letter to Joe Biden asking Joe Biden not to to drop the charges of espionage against Assange. And now the prime minister of Australia has come out because Assange is an Australian citizen asking um, President Biden to drop the charges against Assange. And for those who don't know, Julian Assange was the uh, was the founder, one of the founders and the um, editor of uh, WikiLeaks. He's in prison in London. Uh, then, oh, from 1230 to one, I've got Laith Marouf joining me from Lebanon. And we're going to be talking about the politics in Palestine, the latest events that have been happening there. And then uh, from one to two, I've got uh, John Jeter joining me. And uh, we're going to be talking about Hakeem Jeffries. We're going to be talking about an article in the Wall Street Journal, um, the, the, the mayors of the largest four uh, cities in the country are all black. What does that mean for black people? So that's what we're going to, that's an example of what we're going to be covering uh, this Saturday from 11 to 2 uh, Eastern on Sirius XM 126 Urban View. The show is called Inside the Issues. Quickly on the book, the book is, um, it's, it's there in the background, Politics, uh, it's right there. There you go. Politics, another, there you go. Politics, another perspective. Um, uh, analysis on race, war, ethics, and the American political landscape in the age of Obama. It's a collection of uh, my op-eds over about a 12-year period. They are uh, arranged thematically, race, war, ethics, in the age of Obama. Uh, Dr. Walters actually wrote the introduction to the book. Dr. Clarence Lusane wrote the foreword to the book. And it's, it's, it's each section has a introduction that makes the pieces kind of evergreen. So even though I'm talking about what transpired in the age of Obama, a lot of the things that are in the book you'll find to be still relevant today. And to order the book, uh, I'd prefer you go to my website, wilmerleon.com. Go to wilmerleon.com and order the book directly from me. I'll autograph your copy and get that out to you. And you can find the price of that on the website. All right, thank you. You know, my question now is, as we get ready to close out, I wanted to know, Dr. Leon, first of all, I am very gracious for you to accept this invitation. I didn't expect that I could get catch the big fish in one of my first two episodes. I was thinking somewhere down I had to work my way up, but you were very gracious. And I told my wife, because when I called you, you know, I was in my office and I told my wife, I said, Doctor, I'm talking to Dr. William Leon on the phone. And she couldn't believe it. I was like, Yeah, listen to this. You hey know, man, y'all need y'all just need to get out more. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> if, I'm oh, impress, yeah. if I'm impressing, if I'm impressing you, you you need to get out more. Oh, but anyway, yeah, but anyway, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, you know, we, you know, we're gracious that you accept that that invitation. But I want to ask you a personal question, and that is, you know, uh, how can I personally help others keep Dr. Ron Walters' legacy alive so that our so that we can inspire other people of African descent to become, you know, to study political science as a discipline and formally. By doing what you're doing, by reading his work, by talking about his work and uh, by doing shows like this, uh, I would, I would suggest you, you reach out to uh, some of his other students, reach out to, uh, to Bob, reach out to Clarence, reach out uh, uh, to, uh, to some of the others, Sekou Franklin and, and uh, Artemisia, Dr. Artemisia Stanberry. I mean, you know, my crew, my classmates, um, because they're all in their own uh, areas of specialization and in their own institutions, they're carrying on the, the life and the legacy. You can also, there's a, there's a Ronald Walters Institute at Howard University. Uh, you can support that. Um, 
But I, again, I would say reach out to those of us that were blessed enough uh, to have been able to spend time with him and continue this dialogue uh, because he is still incredibly relevant. Uh, if it, maybe more so now than ever. And uh, you might even want to try starting a reading group. Start reading his books and get, you know, there's a uh, there's a an organization in Philly called the, the Saturday Free School. And uh, uh, and it's, it's it's run by Dr. Anthony Montero, brilliant scholar. And they the 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 group is they have like five different satellite groups. They all focus on different, some focus on Baldwin. Tony's group focuses on Du Bois. And they read all of Du Bois's work and they talk about his work. They unpack his work, start a, a, a Ron Walters reading group uh, in Detroit. And that's how you, that's how you keep uh, his message alive. Well, thank you for that advice and really encouraging advice. And I want you, I want Dr. Uh, Leon, I want you to leave us with some words of some inspiration because we know we, we are already in December. Today is December the 1st, 2023 is right around the corner. And we have a lot of things going on in the world. We have Donald Trump reemerging. We have you know, some of our black athletes and entertainers being attacked and being drug around to different organizations having to apologize. And we have billions of people who are watching this on TV, on social media, as well as we have um, BB, um, Benjamin Netanyahu has become the prime minister yet again in Israel. So could you leave us on a somewhat hopeful note to give us some encouragement as we look for 2023 first and uh i'll say read read get destroy this temple Re I'm doing it backwards get my book and i'm not saying that to sell but i'm just saying read and the first thing you got to do is you've got to take control of your living room. Once you've taken control of your living room, then you can step outside and take control of your front yard. And once you've taken control of your front yard, you can then work on taking control of your block. And once you take control of your block, you can take control of your neighborhood. And it grows from there. It's grassroots. It's very simple. We just make it difficult. Well said. And on that's that how we note, make that's how we make progress. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Well said. And I'm going to close out and leave you on that note. And it was a sheer pleasure to have you here. And it's really you. refreshing Thank to you, hear guys. your views. So now I don't feel like I'm the I'm the crazy man for saying some of these things that you you know you said so eloquently right now. So well, thank you. Leon, I'm going to uh, close out there and, and thank you. Uh, you always, um, we always will welcome you here. And maybe next time my cameras and stuff could be as clear as yours. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Hey, man. Peace and blessings. First thing you gotta do it, make it long story short. You gotta you gotta have what you never had in this country. That's a group self-interest. You've been inculcated and coordinated and brainwashed and believe that you got some obligation and responsibility to save the world. You gotta save everybody first before you save yourself.